got it all uploaded. AMD FX computer that could play modern games. If I was able to make a gaming computer out of inferior parts from 10 years ago, what kind of computer could I make with the best parts from 10 years ago? Here we go again. In a previous four-part series, I attempted to build the world's fastest AM3 Plus computer using AMD's infamous FX processor. Despite using arguably one of the worst AMD has ever produced, I was able to build a PC capable of running modern software and playing the latest games. In this series, I explore what happens when we build a computer using the best technology from the last decade. How does it compare with my previous build, and how does it stack up in 2024? For this challenge, I need to lay down some ground rules. Rule 1. Consumer products only. There are a lot of server options and Xeon products I could explore. However, I'm focusing on hardware that a PC building consumer would have chosen for their high-end performance build. Rule number two, DDR3 memory only. Building a PC running DDR4 memory would feel a little bit like building a computer with 2024 components and comparing it with a PC from 2014. Adding to this, my previous FX build was on a DDR3 motherboard. Keeping the memory consistent will allow for a better comparison between the two builds. Rule number three, modern SSD and video cards will be used. Just like last time, the motherboard is the platform I'm building from. Once selected, every other component is fair game when it comes to squeezing performance out of the system. Now that we've established the rules, let's take a look at what I've picked out for the build. The first item on my shopping list is a new case. The old one worked okay, but it was just really cramped and didn't have a lot of room for expandability. So let's see what I got. So I decided to go with this, the MX30G Pro from Cougar. It's the same company that makes the original case. The only difference between these two is this one is a little bit wider, a little bit taller, can fit more stuff, and it has a glass panel on the side. So as you can see, it can in the future hold up to 360 millimeter water cooling and much bigger graphics cards. So my one video where my graphics cards hanging out the side of the case, not a problem for this one. You'll notice that the glass panel kind of sits on the side of the case. It's almost like an afterthought. Something else we should do while we have the camera going. With the case sorted, let's take a look at the components I'll be putting into this build. First up, a Corsair 850 watt power supply, a Noctua D15 CPU cooler, my NVMe hard drive, a Radeon 6750 XT, all of my fans, and my wireless network adapter. And for the new pieces, I'll be installing the following. An MSI Gaming 7 motherboard, 32 gigs of Corsair Vengeance DDR3 memory. That was a really difficult find. An Intel 5775C CPU, and one mystery upgrade that you'll see at the end of the video. All of these components I got on eBay, except for the hard drive and the video card. Everything else I bought at more than, at either a 50% discount or like in the case of the motherboard, RAM and CPU, the total for all three was about $160. I'm gonna do a couple of things differently with this case. So the first one being, I'm going to install a fan on this side. So as you can see here, I've drawn a detailed diagram that right here should be the center um, of the CPU. Mount the fan and I should have enough space in this case in order to be able to blow some air on the back. So if you're new to the channel, you'll quickly realize that I basically cut up and modify everything I own. And this is no exception. I'm putting my best engineering skills on display. Despite my excessive use of tape and primitive drawing, I think it turned out pretty good. 
moving on to assembly, I put the IO shield in and start getting the back fan disassembled. Then I run into a problem with the top fans. It's hard to see, but none of these holes line up. Tabling that problem, I move on to the front. And as you can see here, I'm riding the struggle bus. I cannot figure out how to get this front part of the case off. But after a lot of pushing, prying, and pulling, this happens. There we go. Haha! -ha. With that problem figured out, I moved on to the front fans, and then I had an epiphany for the top fans. So I was looking at this case again, and it looks like it's right side by side like that. So that's what I'm going to do. Next, I drop in the motherboard with the CPU already installed, and I find my next problem. It isn't going to fit in the case, but I thought of this. I have a backup plan. Assuming I'd have fitment issues, I picked up this 120 millimeter Be Quiet fan. And after I got it installed, it was very close, but it just fit. From there, the rest of the build went pretty smooth. And the mystery part that I'm going to install in this project is this 5 inch smart screen. This will show me real time statistics about what's going on inside the computer. And it was kind of a neat concept and I wanted to try it out. So I'll get this installed and get everything up and running. And there you have it. My first Intel build is complete. Now, what I did differently about this Intel retro build versus my AMD FX retro build is that I got a bigger case for this one. Now, my last one, I had it in a very small case and I didn't really think about the future. But moving forward, I know we're not going to stick with the same old tech and it'll be nice to have a case that can grow with the computer. Next up, and, and something else I did a little differently, I added this screen. Now, I wanted to add something a little bit unique and interesting to the computer, and I think this was a great addition. It's fairly inexpensive, and it's easy to install. You can get them on Amazon. Um, my son and family, they all think it's cool because it's got Dragon Ball Z, but it has a bunch of other themes. The thing I really like about this, though, is it has real-time statistics on the GPU, CPU, um, and even memory usage in the computer. So instead of having MSI Afterburner up running all the time, I can look at this screen for some quick statistics on how the computer's doing. Another thing you'll notice is I cut a hole in the back of this case for that intake fan. It's a little bit controversial. I think for these older computers, it makes a little bit more sense than maybe for a modern one, but we'll look at the numbers and let you decide. So let's get into today's real topic the Intel 5775C processor that's in this computer. Now, the processor came out in 2014, and what was really interesting about it is it came with upgraded video graphics. Now, at the time, uh, it wasn't really that exciting. The thing that was most interesting about that processor is for this Intel chipset and this CPU socket 1150, it was the only processor that came for these types of motherboards that was using the at that time new 14 nanometer process everything prior to that was on 22 nanometers and that meant that this processor was more advanced than anything else that came for the platform and really 
should never even been on this platform in the first place. It was kind of an interesting experiment. Well, there's some interesting things about this processor that makes it kind of relevant in 2024. At least I think it might be. Now, AMD is currently pioneering this whole 3D V cache, but they really didn't start that process. Adding more memory to the CPU itself has been around for a while. In fact, this processor from 2024, it has 128 megs of cache on the chip, where the brand new AMD processors only have 64 megs. We'll talk about some of the limitations of this. We'll talk a little bit about how the two technologies are a little different, but it'll be interesting to benchmark this processor and see how it holds up with applications and games of today. So with that, let's get into this and start testing this computer. All right, and for my overclocking settings, here's what I've got. I've gone to advanced, set everything all core. I'm at 4,300 megahertz, put everything in fixed mode. As you can see in my settings, I had everything set. The turbo boost, this um, Intel stepping technology, come down, my 2,666 megahertz RAM, uh, I've overclocked to 2,800 megahertz. My voltages are set as, as follows, 1.355 volts and 1.660. Under CPU features, you need to set your Intel C state to enabled. Then you need to also set your package C state limit to C6. You save this and reboot. You come back into the BIOS and the only thing you do differently is you come back to your settings advanced, integrated graphics, disable. Make sure that this is dialed down for the shared memory as low as it'll go and that your primary uh, graphics is the discrete graphics card. And that's it. The most important setting here is just making sure that the onboard video is disabled. That will unlock the video memory and the CPU will then flip and use it as an L4 cache. First game up is gonna be Helldivers 2. So let's see what I've got this set to now that it were loaded in. So just a quick rundown of the display settings for the game. I had the graphics set uh, um, kind of a mixture of ultra high and medium. The only one that was uh, low was just space quality. It didn't really impact the game. The, uh, the other thing I have is the display. I didn't get video of this, but it is 1920 by 1080. Once I'm into the game though, I mean, 75 frames per second. Frame time graph is nice and smooth. So let's go get some bugs. So after navigating the game a little bit, find a good place to drop in, it was time to play. This game is way more CPU intensive because between loading and loading cut screens, it's spiking the processor. Oh, these poor guys are not gonna be happy. So this is footage from the very first time I played the game after installing it on this computer. And you can see it's running horribly. It's bottoming out at seven frames a second, major stuttering going on, not a great experience. But what was interesting is it only did this the very first time. And then every other time I played the game, it ran fine. 70 frames a second, had no issues, nice smooth graph. So I think what was happening here is it was just building the shaders and kind of unpacking the game for the first run. So I played with some of the settings. I played the game for a while and it was playable. It, it was fine. Um, 50 to 60 frames a second. Uh, it's not, you know, e-gaming territory, but it's playable. Uh, and the next time you load into the game, I got a little bit more frame rate, but as far as uh, is it playable on a 10 year old computer? Yeah, I was kind of pleasantly surprised. I know the FX processor could not have done this well with this game. So let's check out the next title. And we're back again with Fortnite. So right off the bat, I am, you know, compared to the AMD FX processor, uh, I'm seeing triple digits for frames per second. The other one was maybe 50s and 60s on these settings. So, I'm already way above, probably 40, 50 frames a second above 
what that FX processor could do. And the longer I played Fortnite, the better this experience got. So as far as playability, this is way better than the AMD FX computer I had built before. So for my last two tests, I'm going to be showing the effects of the L4 cache. In this segment, I'm playing Fortnite and I have the L4 cache disabled. I've turned the graphics up a little bit and I've kind of changed a couple of the options. And you can see I'm kind of just riding in the double digits, 60s, 70s. Um, it's not that bad of a playing experience. It has some hitches, but overall pretty good. Now let's take a look and see what happens when we enable that cache. All right, now we're back again, and this time we have the ED RAM enabled, meaning the processor has full use of that L4 cache. And right away, you can tell the gameplay experience is far better. The frame time graph is smoother. I'm in the triple digits for frames per second. This is a much better experience. So this just kind of goes to show how important having that additional memory on the chip and, and how important it is to modern games. And it's so interesting because this old processor wasn't really known for a, a gaming chip or anything special. And having that extra L4 cache really didn't benefit it 10 years ago. But now, now you can play some modern games with it. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I mean, compared to my FX build, this one's way better. Uh, it will last a lot longer. Uh, and, and it just it's a better technology overall. And finally, the last topic I'm going to cover is cooling. On the left, you can see what the temperatures were when I had the fan going on the back of the motherboard. So this was the hole I cut in the side of my case. And on the right, after you know 20 minutes of gaming, you can see what the temperatures are when I unplug that fan and plug the hole. And really, it didn't really make any difference. I think maybe if you really watch I get two degrees Celsius at times when it spikes, uh, a little bit better performance when I have the fan you know, going on the side of the case, but it doesn't make that big of an impact. And I think the reason is um, on the FX processors at 220 watts, I think those processors would just run so hot and were such a beast that having extra fan cooling on the back of the motherboard would make like a five to seven degree difference. But on this Intel one, only pulling 60 watts of power, it really doesn't make any difference at all. Maybe, like I said, you could say maybe one or two degrees Celsius. So probably not worth the extra effort, but I still like it. It's peace of mind that I can run it a little bit cooler than what I normally would, uh, but I wouldn't recommend it. And that about sums it up for this video. Thanks again for watching, and if you like this kind of content, consider subscribing.